Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Master Books podcast. Today, I am interviewing our author, Simon Turpin. He has several books with us, including Scoffers, Responding to Those Who Deliberately Overlook Creation and the Flood. And today, we're going to talk about his new book, Adam, First and the Last. The reason we're talking about this book, it's a very important topic, is because many theologians, many seminaries, many churches are teaching now that Adam was a fable or a myth or just a story. But it's very, very important that we understand and believe that Adam really existed, that he's the supernatural creation of our God. So he is going to talk to us about he, what he wrote in the book, how it will help you and your family. I'll be giving away a digital copy of this book to one person in the Master Books app, as well as one person in the Moms of Master Books Facebook group. So stay tuned. We're going to get started. Here at Master Books, we are dedicated to help you disciple your children and develop a strong faith as a family. With Pro Bible Homeschool curriculum and beautiful books that honor God as Creator. We offer online courses to help your family worship and serve God. You will also find morning baskets and devotionals for the whole family. Our mission is ink on paper to touch eternity, and we have been publishing Christian books for this purpose since 1975. Find your Pro Bible Homeschool curriculum at masterbooks.com. Well, welcome to this Master Books podcast, Simon. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Jennifer, for having me with you. It's wonderful to get a chance to meet you in person. We've emailed for a couple of years, and I want you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, about your family and your work. Well, as you said, my name is Simon, and I work for Answers in Genesis in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. um, Europe as well. I've, I've spoken in uh, mainland Europe, Russia, Spain. Um, different places. Um, I've worked for AIG since uh, 2015. And uh, before that, I was working for a church. And so my background is in uh, theology. And I'm married uh, to my wife, Jessica, and we have seven children, uh, five girls, two boys, uh, two sets of twins uh, oh there. Um, yeah, and we home educate. Um, very passionate about home education. In fact, um, my wife and I run a, a little website called uh, Leading Them Out, Why Christian Education Matters. So, so if people want to look that up, um, yeah, we're very passionate about home education. Uh, we had a, a big conference, uh, well, a big conference for the UK, where we had about 200 adults and 300 children join us earlier this year in April. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had Master Books curriculum um, sell really well there. People were really Wonderful. interested. And there's a real hunger and growth for that. So, yeah, very much i um, excited about uh, the things that we'll discuss. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the Master Books tribe and for being an author and for what you're doing in the UK and in Europe. I want to share with everybody again, in case you're just jumping in in the middle, that Simon has written more than one book and his first book is Scoffers, Responding to Those Who Deliberately Overlook Creation in the Flood. So definitely in line with what Answers in Genesis does. And then the second book is Adam, first and the last. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write on these topics. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jennifer, as I said, before I started work for AIG back in 2015, I was working in a church. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that, you know, being a Christian, you would, you would meet people, you would witness to them. And a lot of people's objections to the Christian faith had to do with uh, the book of Genesis, creation, evolution. And even inside the church, because the church has been so impacted by the culture, and much more in Europe and especially in the UK than it probably has in the States, people were, were confused about creation, um, were confused about the flood, about Adam, about all these issues. Mm -hmm. and so in writing the books, I thought, well, there are a lot of books out there on creation and in this whole issue, but I wanted to come up maybe from a different perspective. So with the Scoffers book, I take people through um, verse by verse through Second Peter chapter three and show how it um, not only applied in Peter's day, but very much applies in our own day. And then with the Adam book, I was trying to do something similar, um, bringing everything scripture says about Adam to bear mm -hmm. 
what's going on uh, in the church today, how it impacts how we, we, we view the world and everything like that. So yeah, that's why I, I wrote the books. Well, wonderful. I'm glad that you really focused on New Testament scriptures to help defend Old Testament scriptures and show why it's really important that we see the whole of scripture and believe the whole of scripture. So why I have mentioned it a little bit in the beginning that a lot of people are discounting Adam as a real living human being that the Lord created with his own breath, with his own hands. I just, I love thinking about the fact that God could just take dust, which he created and then make man and breathe life into him. So why are people doubting that is a problem? Why is your book important for people today? What happens if we don't know the whole truth? Well, yeah, the reason people uh, are doubting it, Jennifer, is is not because of the Bible. It's because uh, they've been impacted by um, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and the whole idea that the world's millions of years old. And so if if you believe that to be true, then you're going to read the Bible in a very different way. And so when you come to um, Genesis chapter two and you read of the creation of man, you're not going to see it as a supernatural creation because, you know, what do you do with all these fossils, you know, the supposed fossils that show our link to ape-like creatures and so on and so forth. And so people try and read it different in different ways. And, you know, they impose these readings on the book of Genesis where they try and read Adam as either a myth, he's a legend, he's a fable, or it, maybe he was some ape-like creature who, mm. who God, you know, breathed into and gave him a soul and became a living being, that sort of thing. Mm. All of those ideas you don't get from the Bible. You have to impose them on the Bible. And when you do that, of course, it impacts how you read this, the rest of Scripture. Because one of the things I try and do in the book is show you that all these different popular theologians that are out there who are who, who are impacting the church who are impacting theological colleges seminaries in the u.s they read the new testament very differently a, a lot of them reject doctrines like the doctrine of original sin would even reinterpret the atonement of jesus christ because the the atonement has to do with jesus's death on the cross mm-hmm. well If you believe in evolution, then there was death and disease and bloodshed all before Adam came into the world. And so you read, you end up having to read the Bible very differently. So in the book, that's what I'm trying to do, show people the consequences, but show people that you can't change the teaching of Scripture. And this is what Scripture teaches about the first Adam and most importantly about the last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. I wanted to read on the back of your book. It says, without the first, there would have been no need for the last. The first, supernaturally created by God, given dominion over creation, enjoyed a brief, unique, unbroken relationship with the creator. But his disobedience to the creator's command brought sin into the world, and he and his wife were driven from the garden in Eden into the darkness of a sin-cursed world. Then the last, the eternal son of God, born of a virgin in a sin-cursed world, truly God made flesh, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, obeyed the law of God perfectly, yet gave his life as a ransom for sin so that we could obtain salvation, reconciling the broken relationship with God caused by the first Adam. So really, we have to have both to have the truth. And the truth is so important. If And culture does this, and it's been doing it for generations. If we go off one hair today, we are the next generation and the next generation, or even in the next five days, we can go off even more and more and be so out of sync with the Lord and with his protection and the government of the kingdom of God. So I'm thankful that you are helping everybody see both sides are important. And if if we're going to evangelize, if we're going to share the gospel, we have to know there was a first Adam. Absolutely. I was out on the streets in the UK on, on Saturday with some members of our church handing out gospel tracts to people. And, you know, it can be very difficult. You live in a culture where many people in the Western world, especially if you're sort of ethnically from the West, uh, from mm-hmm. mainland England, Europe, that sort of thing, they'll walk by, the the, the reluctant to to stop and talk with you about the gospel because they think, well, that's all make-believe. We know that's been disproven by uh, modern science. And of course, when they think of modern science, they're they're thinking of evolution and millions of years, which is not 
really science at all. It has nothing to do with observation, mm -hmm. experiment, that sort of thing. And so, yeah, it, you, when you come to, to evangelize a lost culture, you really need to know, well, how am I going to do this? Then if you have a culture that no longer believes in, in the word of God. And in one of the chapters in the book, uh, I show you how the apostle Paul did that in a, in a very similar culture when he went to, when he went to Greece, when he went to Athens. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, there are examples for us in scripture and, and those examples really help us when we think about evangelism in our modern Western world. Absolutely. And Ken Ham wrote a book not too long ago called gospel reset. reset. Yeah. yeah. Explaining to us that we can't evangelize the same way we used to. The gospel never changes. The message is the same. The solution is the same, but people don't even know what sin is anymore because they don't believe in God or scripture, or a lot of them don't. And one of the things I really like about your book is you, you're helping people see that if you're not taking the whole, mm -hmm. you're really an inconsistent Christian. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. If you, if you don't accept the beginning of, of the Bible, the book of Genesis is real history and you try and interpret it differently then what you're going to do with the rest of scripture. Because the fact is the, the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament apostles all view Genesis as, as real history. And the doctrine that you see in the New Testament is, is taken from that history in the book of Genesis. If you just think about, you know, when you think about Adam, Adam lays the foundation for the design of the family. Well, in our world today, you ask people about the family and you're going to get a, a bunch of confusion about um, what it is to be male, what it is to be female. But if you go back to the book of Genesis, well, God creates us male and female. He creates the family. There's no confusion there from the first man and from the first woman. You need to understand Adam to understand what death is. Death is the penalty uh, for sin. It was the disobedience Adam brought into the world. You know, Paul tells us that in Romans chapter five and so on and so forth, sin, salvation, you know, even most importantly, why Jesus came into the world. In the book, um, in, in one of the chapters on Jesus's life, in his incarnation, I talk about the, the messianic promise in Genesis 3.15. And of course, if you go to um, seminary, Bible college today, you won't get many um, Old Testament professors teaching you that Genesis uh, 315 is a messianic promise about a coming savior. Why? Because evolution isn't just about, you know, man evolving from ape-like creatures. It's It also impacts how you read the history of the world and what you believe about the first humans and, and how intelligent they were. And that impacts our view of scripture. Could Moses even write those things? And so I address those issues in the book and show actually that promise of a savior is part of, of, of what Moses writes about in Genesis 315 and you see that drama the history of redemption played out all the way through the old testament and with the coming of our lord jesus in the new testament when he is born of a virgin and he comes to, to die on the cross as a substitute for our sins well thank you for explaining that and i'm excited for people to dig into this book who did you write this for who are you hoping reads this book you know what, Jennifer, there are a lot of great books by Master Books through AIG that um, touch on a lot of different issues for the family and so on. I wrote this for people who are interested in the Bible. Um, if you're a student of the Bible, if you're a pastor in the church, even a lay, lay person that mm -hmm. want to maybe dig a little deeper and understand what's going on in our world, what's going on in the church, um, what a lot of famous evangelicals are teaching about these issues. That's who I really wrote the book for because, you know, there are a lot of great books out there. Maybe that deal with it from a different perspective. I was trying to maybe dig a little bit of deeper and, and, and show you actually we can trust scripture. Um, doesn't matter what the objection is. We can trust it. And the, the message of Adam is important from Genesis 1 all the way through to the New Testament. In fact, half of the book is about the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, because if you mess with the first Adam, then you really mess with the last Adam, the Lord Jesus. And we can't do that without, you know, you mess up the doctrine of salvation. So the book is written primarily for those who are very much interested in the Bible. And if we're Christians, <laughs> we should be interested in the Bible, but it'll help you maybe dig a little bit deeper into some of these issues. Absolutely. Do you feel like um, parents need to read this book? I wouldn't say it's for children, but if it's for parents, absolutely. Because here's the thing, as I've, I've said, I mean, I'm living in the UK. 
Uh, you guys are in the U.S. and the I've been to the U.S. a, a number of times, and the U.S. culturally is very different. All those similarities between the U.K. and the language that we speak, although we may spell <laughs> a few words differently, there's this the similarities there um, because we have a common heritage. But culturally, um, the U.S. probably is a lot more Christian than uh, the U.K. is, and that's mm-hmm. because we've been impacted a lot longer with secularism, um, enlightenment thinking, that sort of thing. And so people really have a a messed up view of what they think Christianity is all about. And that's why I've tried to maybe dig a little bit deeper into the book, do evangelism, then some of the, you know, baby food that's sometimes given to us is okay. But if you if you're living in a different culture, then you you need solid food, that Mm -hmm. will really really help you answer some of the more difficult questions regarding scripture. And so that's what I've tried to do in the book. Well, I can see how it's very important for families, especially the Master Books families who are discipling their children at home through home education, that they have the answers so that they can prepare their children and themselves to defend against the lies their own mind before they even try to evangelize, but to actually have an answer when that idea comes from culture to themselves and be able to say like, no, I already know the truth. I've seen the truth and the truth will set us free. And Psalm 107 says it heals us and delivers us. So we've got to know the truth. And I really want the friends of ours that are listening to this to consider getting a copy, studying it for yourself, but also recommending it to your pastors And if you're involved with like a Bible college or seminaries or students in seminaries to recommend it even further on up into um, the world of Christian education, because it's imperative that we have the answer. And a lot of times we think we're just a mom, we're just a dad, we're just small in this world. And we don't have to have all this information down because we're not going to have a voice in that area. But one of the sweet books that Master Books produces for young children is called not too small at all. And it's about a mouse that gets on the ark and the impact that that had, that they had their little lives. And you just never know what your knowledge of this area of scripture will do for your family and are do in your conversations in the world and your workplace. And if you know it, God will put you in a place to use it. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we train our children in in the home. We're trying to give them a a Christian worldview in order, not for them just to stay in the home. We want to send them out into the world. Mm -hmm. When we send them out, we want to send them out so that they're equipped with answers in order to, you know, be able to have conversations with people who are doubting these issues, who are struggling with these issues, who may reject them. And so that they can give a defense of, of their Christian faith. So yeah, Master Books um, plays a, a great role in doing that, Jennifer. Yeah, I'm excited to work for them and be a part of that e- eternal impact that we're making with the books that people are purchasing, and reading and using at home. One of my favorite quotes from your book says, Paul wanted them to understand the foundational history in Genesis so they could fully grasp the gospel message. They needed to remember that the only way for a person to be liberated from the reign of sin brought into the world by the first Adam is through the righteousness bought by the obedience of Christ. And that is from Romans 5, 12 through 21. Can you expound that a little bit? If, if you look at Paul, that when he goes to a culture that's not immersed in um, sort of biblical thinking, mm-hmm. as, as my culture, the UK would have been many, many years ago, when you think about preachers like Whitfield, Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, um, they had that understanding. If you ask someone who God was, they would have said, well, it's the God of the Bible. If you go out into the streets today and you ask someone who is God, you might get a bunch of different answers and it might not be the God of the Bible. That's why when Paul um, goes to, you know, a pagan culture like Athens, he explains, first of all, about the God of creation. He doesn't start by explaining Jesus, maybe you're thinking of what we start in the New Testament. No, he takes he takes them all the way back to um, the God of creation, the one who created the world, who's placed man all around the world, you know, appointed their times, their boundaries. And then he talks about the fact that he's made from one man, all people to dwell on the earth. That one man, of course, is Adam. And that leads him to speak about 
the gospel and the man who will judge the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul actually starts his gospel presentation um, in the book of Genesis, which leads him to talk about the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, because in Romans, he talks about the fact that, look, this one man, Adam, he brought sin and death into the world. You know, through Adam comes disobedience. But through the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ comes obedience the reason jesus came into the world was to fulfill the law of god because the latter the first adam broke god's law and we break god's law because we are in adam and so we need someone who has kept the law of god perfectly and the only one to ever do that is the lord jesus christ which is why mm -hmm. when we come to faith and repentance in him we gain his righteousness because we don't have any of our own and so we need that righteousness of another and so that's why this whole issue is important because it impacts how you understand the gospel. Absolutely. We have to know Adam in order to understand the purpose of Jesus. Yeah. It's just the long and the short of it. We can't avoid one and understand the other. Yeah, absolutely. One of the comments that you made in your book that really got my attention is um, about idolatry and how the denial of Adam as a living created being is a form of idolatry tell us what you mean by that yeah i mean there's, there's um if you think about idolatry we think about the ten commandments and one of the first commandments is that we should have no other idols no other images of god you know those are physical things that people in the old testament days would have done and still in, in many places in the world would do today but that's not all idolatry is because we can commit idolatry in our minds when we try and deny an attribute of God in scripture or we allow our minds um, to determine who God's character is. And so people do this when um, they read Genesis because they think, well, I know better than God mm -hmm. because I know that's not how God created the world. He used evolution to create the world. And so therefore you begin to commit idolatry because you begin to change God's character. In fact, this is what you see in the Old Testament, Jennifer. If you think about um, the, the history of Israel in the Old Testament, they, they commit what we call syncretism when they blend elements of pagan worship into the worship of the one true and living God because you often read about false gods um, in, in the Old Testament, Baal, and the Hebrews got chase after this, this, this false God and they try mm -hmm. and blend it into the, the worship of the one true God. And they have to be confronted by the prophets to say, no, what are you doing? You need to turn from, from these wicked ways and repent and come back to worship in the one true God. And so when we try and redefine who God is or his attributes or some essential part of his character, who he is, what he's done, such as created the world, because God is our creator evolution well tries to say or theistic evolution would try and say well yeah god sort of kicked the whole thing off and then he stood back and watched the whole thing go but that's not what the bible tells us so you are actually trying to redefine the role of god and that's how you end up committing idolatry we, we can't al allow ourselves to get off the hook in these things because you know that's a serious charge because the bible tells us we have to love the lord our god with all our heart soul mind and strength and so mm -hmm. we need grasp these issues we need to think about these issues biblically and you know there's no more serious charge in the bible than that of than that of idolatry and so yeah we need to get back to scripture and allow god's word to speak to us and not allow ourselves to try and redefine the character of god right and the bible tells us that i get emotional thinking about it that pride goes before the fall yeah. and so literally there was a fall in the garden of Eden. And literally there have been many falls in my own life and it is out of ignorance or absolute resistance to the word of God and me wanting what I want when I want it. Yeah. And so I am so grateful that people like yourself are taking the time to do the real hard work of going against culture, against the long war, against God and saying, no, we have to believe this. And this is why we can believe it, because God does not lie. And there's a common thread throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. And if you're going to believe one word of the Bible, why are you going to doubt another word of the Bible? Absolutely. And we we should have full confidence in the word of God, because that's what it is. It's the, the word 
of the one true and living God. And, you know, when you look at the world around you, you'll find that science backs what the Bible says up. Because in the book, I try and point out, um, actually, science comes from a, not only a Christian worldview, but it really arose out of a belief in the, the historical Adam, a belief in the supernatural creation of Adam, because people um, in this country, like uh, Francis Bacon, who was sort of the man who came up with what we call observational science, he came up with that methodology. Mm -hmm. He realized, look, as, as creatures, we are fallen in, in our nature. And maybe when, when God created Adam, Adam obviously didn't have a fallen nature and he had all this wisdom. So he thought, well, look, this is what we're trying to do in science. We're trying to recapture some of that wisdom. Mm. That, and, and, and so he believed the founding fathers of science, all these great men, believed in a real historical Adam and that impacted how they did science. And so we should fear nothing from anything in science because science only confirms when it's interpreted correctly, the word of God. Absolutely. And I, it makes me think about um, Joshua, be strong and courageous. We have to be strong and courageous first to know the truth. Caleb and Joshua went into the land and said, yes, there are giants. We look like grasshoppers. But we know our God and he is no grasshopper. <laughs> you know, that's my paraphrase. You know, yeah. he is greater than the giants that are in the land. And so they took the land eventually. And so we can the same thing about I'm not too small. I'm not too small to know the truth and to go take back the land in my own family, in yeah. my church, in my community and to resist what culture is trying to do. And yeah, there'll be some pushback. We yeah, will absolutely. pay a price for standing up for the word, but I'd rather pay a price here for standing up for the word than to stand before God and him say, Jennifer, you remember all those books from master books that you had filling your house, every bookshelf full of all these books from master books. What did you do with that? Exactly. And you, and you remember, um, Jennifer, David, when he faced the giant Goliath, he slew him. And yes. why did why, why was he able to do that? Because if you read the text, he says he knows who God is. David knew who God was. And because mm -hmm. he knew who God was, he was he was fearful who, of who God was. But he trusted that he could overcome the giant Goliath mm -hmm. because of God. And that's why he was able to do that. And so when we face these giants, if we're trusting in the Lord, we will overcome because of, of who God is. Right. And faith is our victory. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. And we have to know the word to have faith. So yeah. thank you so much for the work that you've done with this, these books, particularly this one, and for what you're doing there in Europe and the UK. And I want to bless you. I want to bless your book. I want that I've already prayed before we got on this call that the Lord would take what we're doing here today and put it in the right hands of the right people who will take this on and believe the truth and take the truth into their culture, into their world. So I want to speak a blessing over each one of you that you have ears to hear, that you have a hunger and a thirst for truth and righteousness, that your whole household will be a household of faith. And the generations that come after you will know who God is because you helped them believe. So I pray that in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, I pray that will be a blessing to everyone who reads it. Absolutely. Thank you for all of your faithfulness. And we will talk to you soon. Hopefully we'll see you back on the podcast. Yeah, great. I'll be glad to come back on. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. We'll see you back at the next one. And don't forget, I'm giving away a copy of Adam, the first, the first and the last. You can find it at masterbooks.com. I'll have links to it in, and the preview of it in the show notes. And um, just check us out over at the Masterbooks app and the Moms of Masterbooks Facebook group. All right. Thanks, Simon. We'll see you later. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for joining us today for the Master Books podcast. It was really fun to do this with you today. We hope that you'll take a moment and rank and review the podcast wherever you are listening or watching so that others can find it more easily. We loved having you here and we look forward to being with you on the next podcast. It comes out every other week, Mondays at 5 a.m. See you then.